Hey guys, my name is Trevor Sullivan and welcome back to my video channel. Thank you so much for joining me for yet another video in our Rust programming tutorial series. Now in the last video in this playlist, I actually covered a topic that falls kind of outside the realm of just the Rust core programming language and standard library. And in that video, we covered Amazon Web Services SDK with Rust and how you can automate things in the Rust AP, uh, the AWS APIs. But we're actually going to go back and focus really on the core of Rust itself. And we're going to be specifically talking about how to test your Rust code when you create a Rust project or crate for your application or library. So over in the Rust programming language book here, there's a section in section 11. It talks about how to write automated tests. So this goes into some of the fundamentals behind how to write tests. In particular, you're going to notice that there is this attribute that you can apply to a module called CFG. And then CFG actually takes an input argument. And if you set that to test, then that will restrict that entire module to only be executed or compiled when you actually run a cargo test CLI command. So when you want to run tests, you use the cargo CLI tool. In the past, we've been using cargo build or cargo run to compile or execute our project. But there's another command called the cargo test command that allows us to execute our automated tests in our binary application project or in a library project for a crate that you've created. Now, we also have another attribute that we want to pay attention to here, and this is the test annotation attribute and this allows you to designate a specific function as a test that needs to be executed by the cargo cli so even though you've declared this cfg up here at the module level you also need to annotate your individual tests as well and tests at the end of the day are literally just functions so a function is a test a test is a function it's kind of the same concept there but when the cargo CLI is going through your source code and actually looking for different tests to execute. It'll look for this right here, and it'll also look for this test right here. Now, this CFG test here is actually a little bit more of an exclusion than an inclusion, because by default, if you have a module right here and you tell cargo to build your project, then that module is actually going to get included in the resulting binary that gets produced by the build process, right? So when we specify CFG test here, what we're actually doing is we're saying we want to exclude this particular segment of code, this entire module from our comp compiled binary when it produces that complete binary because this is exclusively for testing purposes. And so that's what helps to keep our binary sizes smaller, as well as improving our compilation times. Now, as I mentioned, the function that you write here is basically the test itself. And there's a few different assertion macros that we can use that help us to determine if a particular condition is met. So we have assert equals here in this particular example. But then if you go out to the Rust standard library, let's just do a search for Rust standard here. And then we'll just do a search for assert in here. And as you can see under macros here, there is an assert macro. There's assert equal, assert not equal, and things like that. So those are some different assertions that we can use inside of our test functions to actually return either our, a true passing result or successful result or a failure result or false in the case that the test does not actually pass. So that's really the basic structure of our tests here. So what we're going to do is actually write some code that utilizes the technique right here in the documentation. And then we're also going to take a look at this cargo test CLI tool that helps us to execute tests. Now, one other interesting type of test that you can run aside from these unit tests right here is something called a doc test. So what's really interesting is that you can actually embed code samples inside of your documentation. And we actually talked about doc strings in a different video. 
But what you can do is embed a code sample in your documentation strings, and then the Cargo CLI will actually seek out those code snippets in your documentation, and it will execute them just like test functions. So you have the option of writing your unit test functions like regular Rust functions and including them as a test using the test attribute here, but you also have the option of specifying your tests in the doc strings as well. Now, I'm not quite as much of a fan as of the doc strings as I am of writing regular functions here because the IntelliSense that you get from the Rust analyzer isn't going to work properly. You're not going to get syntax highlighting and all of those nice language features. So generally speaking, I would recommend avoiding doc strings in favor of using just standard functions in Rust for your automated tests, but it's really up to you what route you want to go. So before we actually jump in and start some hands-on coding here, I just wanted to ask you to support this channel by liking this video, subscribing, and leaving a comment down below. This channel is kind of sponsored by you, the viewers, right? I don't get paid specifically to create any content on this channel, so any kind of support you can provide would be awesome. Also, I have an affiliate link to an Amazon store down below, so any orders that you place through that Amazon store will go towards supporting this channel as well. All right, let's go ahead and jump in and start writing some code. So I am SSH'd from VS Code into my Rust2 dev system here. So what we're going to do for starters is just as we typically do, create a new project for our tests here. So I'll say cargo new sample dash tests. And then we'll go ahead and open that up. So I'll do control K, control O, and then we'll open up the sample tests directory here. So this created a new binary project. So it's an application that we can build and execute as opposed to a library project, which is just a crate containing a library of functions and data structures and traits and things of that nature that are exported from it. And so if we go into our main.rs file here, as we typically know from other videos in this playlist, you've probably seen this. This is just our entry point into our application. So if we do a cargo run here, it's just going to run the main function and we'll get our result here. But let's say that we want to build out some additional helper functions and then write some tests against those functions, right? So I'm just going to get rid of the standard hello world print line statement here. And instead, I'm going to declare a function that allows us to accept a couple of input arguments, and then it'll return a value back to the caller. And then this function will serve as a basis for our automated tests that we'll build out after we actually build the core functionality. So I'm going to create a function here in the same main module here, and we'll call it get full name. And then I want to accept a couple of input arguments. So I want to take a person's first name and their last name, and then I want to join those together with a space in between, and that will be the resulting output from this function. So we have two input arguments, first and last name, and then we also need to declare the return type from the function. So let's take the first name as a string slice. We'll take the last name as a string slice as well. And we're going to return a string type here. Now we're going to get this error saying mismatch types because we declared a string return type, but we are not actually returning any value from the function body thus far. So we actually need to implement the function and this error will go away. So what we're going to do is inside of the body of this function, we're just going to create a new string. So we'll say let result equal nothing, just an empty string, basically. And then we'll take that string. Let's actually declare it as a string type here. And then we'll do dot to string here as well. That'll turn the string slice into a capital S string that's allocated on the heap. So it's dynamically sized. And then what we can do is say result dot push string. And then we'll start by pushing the first name onto the end of this string. So what we're going to do is add a space. So we're actually going to do push string several different times here. So we're going to add a space second. And then third, we're going to add the last name. So we're going to start by pushing first, then we'll add a space. And then finally, we'll push the last name back to this string. All right, so now what we can do is return the result back to the caller. 
And because we are mutating the string, we also need to designate it as a mutable or modifiable or alterable, whatever word you want to use to describe it. But we need to make our string mutable here because we are actually modifying the underlying value of the string by using the push str function call here. All right, so then finally, we just return that string object back to our caller, and that should fulfill the function signature here, right? So what I'm going to do is just say print line, and then we'll pass in a call to get full name, and we'll pass in Trevor and Sullivan. So first name and last name. So now if we do a cargo run, you can see that we get first name, space, last name from our helper function right here. But now we want to do some automated testing around our helper function. We want to validate the inputs and we want to be able to validate the outputs from this function as well to assert or ensure that the given inputs produce the expected outputs, right? Because what if somebody imported this function from my crate library and tried to pass in some really bizarre inputs, right? So maybe they do something like, a, you know, a carrot character, or maybe they do a dollar sign, maybe they do a number three in there somewhere, right? They just really mangle the inputs into this function, right? So I need to ensure that my function that I write is uh, very robust and that it's going to be able to handle these different types of situations, right? So one thing that we could do in the case of somebody passing in some invalid input here would be to simply panic the program and abort execution, right? So we could actually assert from an automated test that the function get full name panics and causes the application to terminate, right? So what I'm going to do is create a separate module down here. So we'll call this mod my tests. And in this custom module that we're creating as a child module of the main module, what we want to do is define our unit tests here. So for starters, we're going to add the CFG attribute up here and specify that this is a test module. And again, when we do a cargo build or a cargo run that causes a build to occur, then this entire test suite will be excluded from that final build because we don't want to include the test code in a production binary that we are distributing to any clients that want to consume that library or that command line utility, right? So what we want to do is declare that CFG test argument there, uh, attribute, and then what we're going to do is write a bunch of individual functions that perform different tests against my get full name function. So what we'll do is say fn test get full name normal input. And what we're going to do inside of this function body, after we designate it as a test to make it discoverable by the cargo test CLI tool, is we're going to call super get full name. Now you're probably wondering, what is super, right? What does that mean? Well, remember that within the main module that we have right here in the main.rs file, we have a child module called my tests. So in order for this child module to reference a function that has been declared in the parent scope, so in the main module, the main module is the parent of the my tests module here. So in order to reference that parent module, the main module, we have to use the super keyword here, and that is going to dynamically go up a step and grab whatever that parent module is, and then we can simply call the function using that super. Something else that we could do is to say use super star and then that will import anything that's declared within the parent module into our local test module. And so in that case, I can just call get full name directly. And even though we're getting an error here, that's not coming from the function name. That's coming from the arguments that are being passed in here. So this is valid syntax where I can import everything from the parent module. And then I can just use those functions as if they were local inside of the child module. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and just eliminate this for simplicity. And I'm going to say super because that's just very explicit in my code. And then I'm going to pass in a first name as a string slice and a last name as a string slice. Now, I expect that this is going to succeed, right? So what I'm going to do is use this assert equal here. 
and I'm going to assign the result. So let's say let result equal the result from that function. And then I'm going to check that result is equal to Trevor space Sullivan. So I'm passing in two different arguments. I want to check the output from the function, which is assigned to this result variable. And then I'm going to compare it to a hard coded string inside of my test library. So now if I do a cargo test command, it's going to automatically detect the tests inside of my program, inside of my crate, because I designated them with this test attribute. Now, what you'll notice is that if I actually comment out or just outright remove that CFG annotation on the module, the test is still detected because I've annotated it with this test attribute here. But again, if I want to exclude this test module from my final build, my production build that I distribute to other users, then the CFG attribute here is what's going to allow me to do that exclusion. So I'm not bloating up my binary that I distribute out to other users with all of my test code, right? So this test attribute here is really essential for cargo test in, to locate those tests, right? So if I were to remove that and then try to run cargo test, you're going to see that zero tests were executed because cargo test did not detect any tests inside of my project. So we need to make sure that we leave that test attribute inside of there. Now, this is a perfectly normal output. So we expected to get this result. We expect that this test is going to pass because we passed in a normal first name and a normal last name. Now, what if we go back to the example where we pass in some mangled input, right? We don't want our function to execute if we have this mangled input. We want to maybe panic or, you know, throw some kind of error message as part of a result object or something of that nature, right? So what we can do is write another test down here and pass in some mangled output to see what kind of result we get. And we can actually declare the result that we expect, very similar to asserting that the result of the function call equals a particular value here. So what we'll do is write another test and we'll say test get full name mangled. Well, let's actually just say maybe special cars. And then we're going to basically do the same thing here where we call the get full name function from the super module, which again is the main module. And this time I'm not going to assign the result because I don't actually need to check the return value. In fact, I'm not even expecting that this function is going to return at all. I'm actually going to expect that if I pass in some mangled input with weird special characters interspersed into either the first name or the last name, I'm going to expect that this function will panic and abort execution. Okay. So in that case, I don't even need to check the return value because the function should terminate before that return value is ever received, right? And the reason that we can do these tests and panic without having to worry about impacting tests is because when you do a cargo test, the by default, the tests themselves are individually executed in separate threads. So cargo itself is running in one thread. It's, it's executing your kind of main entry point in one thread. And then all of the individual tests are actually kicked off and spawned in external threads. And I actually have another video that goes into depth about threads in Rust. So I would strongly encourage you to study that topic because it's a really good concept to know as you're writing Rust applications that you need to be high performance. So what we're going to do now is add in another attribute. And we haven't covered this yet, but there is an attribute that allows us to check to see if there is a panic from the function, right? And so what we're going to do is use this type down here called should panic. And if we use should panic on our function call, then that is going to check to see if it panics or not. So let me just do should panic here because there's a lot of other panic related stuff. And so within testing, we can use should panic to determine if it's going to panic or not. So what we'll do is back in our code right here, we're going to add in another attribute and we're going to use should panic. So in this case, 
rather than using an assertion to assert that the return value matches some hard-coded value inside of our test, we're actually just going to say, you know what, I'm going to kick off this function with these inputs. And somewhere inside that function, I am expecting the function to panic and throw an error, right? So what we're going to do is pass in these invalid inputs and hopefully our function will panic, right? So we'll do cargo test. And as you can see right down here, it actually failed because the function did not panic, but we expected it to panic, right? So now we have two tests. We have one test that passed. That's our test with normal inputs. And now, now we have one test that has failed because it didn't panic, right? So now we've already declared our test that shows what our desired functionality is, but our function get full name doesn't actually match the desired functionality from the tests. So it's up to us as developers of Rust applications to come in here, find the get full name function and fix whatever is wrong with that function that's causing it to not behave as expected. So what we'll do is check to see if the first name contains certain characters. And so what we can do is call this contains function. So on a string slice, it has a contains function that allows us to check to see if it contains certain characters. So we can pass in a string slice. We can also pass in a slice of cars and we can also pass in a closure. So it also supports passing in a closure that determines if a character matches or not. So what I'm going to do here is just create a string or a slice of or actually an array. Uh, no, this is going to be a slice of cars, actually. And so what we're going to do is check to see if any of these special characters are detected inside of this string. So what else did we have down here? We had an ampersand, a caret, and an asterisk. So I think we've got all of those as long as I add in the ampersand there. So then what we'll do is that is say if the first name contains any of these weird special characters, if that returns true, then we want to call the panic macro and say first name cannot contain special characters. All right. So what we're doing is we're checking the input here and doing some validation on it so that if there is some invalid input. If there's some, if maybe a hacker is trying to throw a bunch of buzzed input data into our function and trying to crack it and trying to break into an application or break into a system, then we're actually going to do some sanitization. We're going to sanitize our inputs and make sure that we're writing safe code that only accepts the expected inputs. And so these weird special characters are not part of our standard inputs. We could add more things like maybe the pipe character or maybe a plus sign and a minus sign as well. Those are all characters that we don't want to see. So you can build out as many characters as you want to in this string slice and do a comparison by using this contains function, right? So right up here, this one should actually cause a panic to occur because it has a caret or hat character there. And same thing with this one down here. This should now fail because it is the test should actually pass because the function is now panicking as a result of that invalid input. So if we run our test again, now you can see that test get full name special cars is now passing. So now we have two passing tests. Now, this is only doing partially what we expect it to because we're only checking to see if the first name contains these particular special characters, right? So if we were to write another test, so we'll say test get full name, first name, special cars. But now what if we pass in some special cars into the last name, right? So the first and the last name are both going to have special cars here. Actually, we already have a test for the first name, so I'm just going to do a normal input for first name. And now we're going to pass in some weird characters for last name. So now if we do cargo test, we now have a total of three tests. Two of those tests are passing and one of those tests is failing because now this time we're passing in some weird characters for the last name input argument, but nowhere inside of this function are we panicking if the last name contains any of these characters. 
So what I'm going to do is just duplicate this code down here. Yes, there are more efficient ways of doing this, like maybe doing a let pattern equal this, and then we can reuse the pattern here. So let's just pass in pattern and then say if last contains pattern, then we can say last name cannot contain special characters. So now we have a unique panic for our first name that's invalid. And now we have a panic for the last name if the last name does not match the expected inputs. So now if we do cargo test, let's go ahead and rename this to last name special cars, just so we know exactly what that's testing. And now all of our tests are passing here. So last name is checking out, first name is checking out, and normal inputs are also checking out. So this is kind of how we can build up a library of tests and make sure that any time that we change something about how our code functions, that our tests are not going to break. You can incorporate the cargo test command in your CI CD pipelines if you're using something like GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps or you know, code build in AWS or GitLab CI CD or maybe Tecton or there's a whole bunch of CI CD tools out there. So you can include the cargo test CLI command in your CI CD pipelines. And if any of your tests fail, you should get a non zero exit code. So let's go ahead and actually do something like comment out this panic here. That'll cause the test to fail once again. And if we echo out the last return code, you can see it's actually 101, which indicates that it's a failure because it's a non-zero code. And so you could abort your CICD pipeline if that error message appears as the last exit code from your application. And that just helps you to write more robust code, right? You don't want to release code that has bugs inside of it. So we can simply check that in our CICD pipeline and make sure that our code is as robust as possible. Now let's talk about how we can move these tests into a separate file. I already did a video on modules in Rust. That's one of my earlier videos in this Rust programming tutorial playlist. So please go check that out. But what we can do is extract all of these tests and put them into a separate file. So what we could do is create a file here called maybe main tests.rs and we could put this inside of this file but now that we have a separate module we don't need to declare the module using that module scope there so we'll just de-indent all of our tests right here and then the other thing that we want to do is actually move this cfg up to the top here but because the module is now the outer component right the module is the file itself so we need to apply this cfg attribute to the outer module, not the inner module, right? So previously, when we declared the module, we just did a hashtag, which means apply this attribute to the following item. But now, because the CFG needs to apply to the outer item, not the following item in the list of lines of source code here, we need to actually do hashtag exclamation point, and that will apply the CFG attribute to the entire main tests module file rather than specifying it as a code block. So now when we do a cargo test, you can see that no tests are being detected here. And that's because our main func our main module here is not referencing main tests. So let's go ahead and reference that module. And now once again, you can see that our tests are executing because Cargo is aware that our main module is referencing the test module. But when we do a Cargo build, the tests will not be included in the resulting binary. All right, so that's how we can separate our tests into a separate file. So that's a really nice way to just kind of organize your code. You can have a, you know, a module like main and then a test file called main tests.rs. Just make sure that you reference those modules from your main module. All right. So one other thing that I wanted to cover is how to do doc testing. So this is unfortunately only supported in library crates, not binary crates. So if I wanted to write a test, a doc test, let's say that I went ahead and did, you know, triple forward slashes here. 
And then the way that we define a doc test is to specify three tilde characters. And then in between those three tilde characters, which is very similar to uh, markdown syntax that we would use to write markdown code blocks, then we can write the code right inside of here. So we could say let full name equal get full name. And we could pass in Trevor and then Jones. And then we could say assert and we'll say full name equals Trevor Jones. So even though this code is inside of the documentation here, we can actually test it by using the cargo test command. But as I mentioned, it's only supported in libraries. So if you were to try to do a cargo test command here, let's do cargo test dash dash help. And then if you see right here, there's this dash dash doc parameter that allows us to test the library's documentation. And this is really important to pay attention to because it says test the library's documentation, not the applications or not the binary entry point documentation. So it has to be a library. So if we try to do a cargo test dash dash doc right here, you can see it says no library targets found in package and then the package name that you tried to run. That's our crate name, right? That's our folder name. So in order for us to properly write this, we actually have to create a library instead. So what we're going to do is just move this entire function, actually. So let's grab the function along with all the documentation. And then we're going to create a file called lib.rs. So now what we're doing is creating a library inside of our crate rather than simply incorporating that into the main function. So now what we can do is reference our library by doing sample tests and then get full name. But we also need to make this function public because now it's part of a library. We need to make sure that that function is exported from the library so that we can consume it in the application. So it's a little bit weird here, but just so you understand, the crate that we've created called sample-tests actually has two different components to it. It actually has a binary entry point called main.rs. And it also has a library called lib.rs. And crates can only define one library, but they can actually define many different application entry points. So that's something that's kind of interesting about crates is that you can have many, many different binaries, but only one library. So it might look like we have a circular reference here where the main entry point is referencing sample tests, but that is actually just a reference to the library called lib.rs. And then we also need to fix our tests over here. So we'll say sample tests and fix the references to that function to make sure that our tests are working correctly as well. And so now we'll do a cargo test dash dash doc. And also we need to fix our reference right here to get full name. So let's go ahead and say sample tests get full name. And hopefully that should work. Awesome. So as you can see, this time only one test executed. And that is because we specified that we only want to run the doc tests. We don't want to run regular tests. We only want the doc tests. There is another parameter here called dash dash tests. And this allows us to test all tests, right? And so if we specify cargo test dash dash tests, then that's going to execute our regular tests not doc tests, not example code, not benchmark code. There's actually several different types of tests. We have the doc tests, we have examples, we have benchmarks, and we have the standard unit tests that we wrote over in this main tests file right here. So that's a little bit about how testing works. Just be aware that tests are executed in their own threads by default. And if you do want to actually specify that you want the tests to execute inside of a single thread. There is actually a way to do that. Let's take a look at the help here. I think it's actually in a separate section. Let's just do a quick search for thread. Yeah, so it's going to happen if we try to run against a binary here. So what we're going to do is say cargo run or actually cargo test, I think that's my problem here, cargo test, dash, dash, and then dash, dash, help. 
And the reason that we have to do this is because you can pass certain command line arguments to cargo test like dash dash doc. That's a parameter that gets passed to the cargo test CLI tool. But if you want to pass a argument to the actual test binary that gets generated, then you actually have to put a dash dash as a separator. And the way that we know that is when you do cargo test dash dash help, you can actually see that there is a dash dash here. And then any arguments after the dash dash are going to get passed to the test binary, not to the cargo test command. So if I do cargo test and then dash dash and then dash dash help, those are going to those are going to be the arguments that we can pass into the test binary that's generated when we compile the tests with cargo test. And so what we can do is either set this environment variable called rust test threads, or we can specify dash dash test threads here. So if we do test threads equals one, now only a single thread is going to be spawned for those tests rather than spawning a separate thread for every single test, right? So you do have the ability to specify how many threads you want to use for executing your tests. But in any case, that's, I think, pretty much everything that I wanted to cover as far as testing goes for now. Hopefully you learned something new from this video. If you did learn something new, please leave a thumbs up. Please leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought of this video and let me know what other ideas you have for other videos that I could produce regarding Rust or other software topics on this channel. Again, please support the channel by going to the Amazon store link and making purchases for certain essential products through that store. I also recommend some electronics that I personally use, like my drone, my computer parts and that kind of thing. So please check out that Amazon store affiliate link. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you in the next video. Take care.